I wanted to first ask you a little bit about your background. So your background is you got your start in architecture, right? So I want to know, how does one make the transition from architecture to filmmaking? Yeah, the classic architecture to filmmaking <laughs> career path. I think there are dozens of us out there. <laughs> um, so my undergraduate and graduate degrees are in architecture. I practiced for um, <clears throat> a decade, and I spent a lot of my architecture career designing facilities for refugees, um, working with NGOs who are working with refugees, and so... Um, I had spent a good bit of my architecture career working alongside refugee communities. Um, and so when, when my husband and I moved to Atlanta and I was catching up with Aaron Bernhardt, who's my partner on this project, um, and I was saying, I, I know I want to transition out of architecture, but I'm not really sure what to move into. And I was saying, I'd like a job that looks like this, but I don't know what that job is. And she was like, it's documentary filmmaking like tell me more <laughs> and um, she was in development on this project and had kind of honed in on the Clarkson community and knew about my work in architecture working with refugees and she said listen I need a partner and that's basically the job description of the partner that I need so I know you don't know how to make movies yet but you'll learn on the job and that's what it did awesome. <laughs> that was five years ago awesome yeah but you see I when I was thinking about it, because like you mentioned jokingly that, the, you know, the, the classic architecture filmmaking, I was thinking, you know, there are actually similarities yeah. between architecture and filmmaking, you know, uh, eye for creativity, working within like budgetary constraints and stuff. But I think that probably what seems to be the most important is working collaboratively yeah. with a team. Yeah. And so I, I'm wondering how it was considering to your first film sharing the responsibilities the duties of a director yeah. uh um with your partner Aaron and and what was that collaboration like getting into like the nitty-gritty of it yeah um how, how did that work um yeah there's definitely a lot of overlap in how you think as a design as a designer and as a filmmaker you know we have to be people that can live in the conceptual and theoretical world and translate conceptual idea into something tangible. And, you know, we're constantly kind of zooming out of the big picture and then zooming into the, and architecture would be a detail and filmmaking would be, you know, a shot and a scene. And um, so we're kind of constantly living and straddling the line between the conceptual and creative world and the kind of tactile, tangible world. Um, and then I think in, in, as an architect and as a filmmaker, especially documentary filmmaking, um, we have to be the kind of dreamer that imagines a thing that doesn't yet exist in the world and also the realist who has to actually make it happen. And, you know, as the director, I'm not an editor, I'm not a sound designer, I'm not a videographer, but I rely on and collaborate with those people that have those skills and to be able to kind of translate, this is our vision, into to translate that and to collaborate with their skill set um, is also something that we do in architecture. I'm not a mechanical engineer, I'm not a structural engineer, but I have to know enough about the parameters and the limitations that they're dealing with to make sure I'm creating and proposing something that will work with the limitations that they have. Um, and Erin and I, as we got going, her background is in journalism prior to filmmaking. And it worked out really well because as we kind of figured out how I could operate within the documentary space and in partnership with her, she really naturally fits in the producer um, role, which is like the um, business leader of a film. So as the producer, we deal with, um, you know, setting a budget, raising all the funding, maintaining a budget, hiring the team, dealing with all the legal aspects of it. And then as the director, we wear the creative, kind of set the creative tone of the film and shape it creatively. And so I kind of naturally fit in the director seat a little more and she kind of naturally fit into the producer role. And so we would kind of support each other, but it made for a really easy kind of delineation as well. So Cool. Yeah. And I'm guessing that with her background in journalism, that's how Katie Kirk came to be involved with the, the project? That would be a really logical <laughs> <laughs> assumption. Um, Katie said this on the record, so I feel that I can repeat it. Um, 
as she says, it all started when she had a huge crush on my dad. <laughs> they oh, wow. went to UVA together. And uh, apparently she had a big crush on my dad. But um, So they knew each other in undergrad. And um, I don't know if any of you saw the series she put out with Nat Geo, um, America Inside Out. It's a really great series. If you haven't seen it, you should. Um, and it came out... Uh, like the beginning of 2018 and a lot of the questions that she was asking through that series were questions we were also asking and so um, as we were getting this film underway my dad just felt like I think Katie would be interested in this so he um, introduced us and she said sure share something with me and we shared a very rough I can't believe we shared that with Katie Couric but we did and um she was like, I'm in. How can I support you guys? So um, it's been a total dream to have her, even just the wind in our sails of having her encouragement and support and obviously insight has been really huge. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would not have put that together. But <laughs> yeah. Thank you for You didn't know Katie had a crush on my dad? No, no. But <laughs> now crazy. we all do. Uh, <laughs> so before we get into more of, I guess, the heavier subjects of the film, I, I did want to ask about the watercolor transitions and and flashbacks well, um is there anything you can share about that like who made those how did those come into the picture yeah so we knew that we would need to animate um certain moments in each of their backstories we actually had one for amina as well that we ended up pulling um because for each of our characters each of our subjects there was a moment for each of them where the trajectory of their life really shifted and um, you know, you saw these two for Chris and Haval, and we felt like we wanted to animate those because um, they felt important, um, too important to just be seeing a talking head kind of interview on screen. And we really landed on the watercolor visual because it felt softer. We felt like we could be more um, abstract with a watercolor style because there's violence and trauma involved with both of them. We wanted to have a style and imagery that wasn't a literal depiction of events, but rather something that would help illustrate the emotions that Chris and Haval and, you know, Haval's family and Chris's friend experienced. And so we worked with a really talented animator, Gina, and um, her illustrator, Will, to um, storyboard these and really help capture, again, the emotion, not the literal depiction of what happened. But every every time I watch this, there are definitely things where I'm like, ugh, and uh, the illustrations, the animations are two of them that I always feel like. I really like how this landed. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 th I thought that they fit into the story in a really natural way. Sometimes those things get crowbarred in. Yeah. And yeah. I felt like the way you guys blended it in, it was almost like soaking into the screen and yeah. then fading out. I really enjoyed that. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong about this, but the title of the film, Refuge, yeah. it seems to have a double meaning. Yeah. The, the first one, the most obvious being refugees coming to America, seeking mm -hmm. shelter uh, for themselves and their family. Um, but the second one seems to be more along the lines of referencing the refuge that white nationalists, like your subject Chris, find in racism. Mm -hmm. um, so could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. I, um, I've mentioned to you before the film, you know, for a long time, we really struggled to stitch the story together. We had this story about Clarkson and Haval and Amina and this... Chris's transformation, and it felt like these two stories kind of occupying the same 90 minutes for a long time, and <clears throat> we felt like when we really boiled the story down to its heartbeat, we felt like this is a story about what it is to seek refuge, to seek belonging and security and hope and identity, and I very much include Chris in that description and what it looks like when we seek that in destructive and harmful places like drug abuse and hateful ideologies, and also what it is to be a source of refuge for somebody else, to be a source of acceptance and belonging for someone else, and the transformative power of that. And you see that in the Clarkson community in this kind of um, radical acceptance culture that they have established. And 
One thing about Clarkston, I wish we could have had more of the community in this film, but um, one thing that's kind of incredible about it is that it's not just a community of people who are really different from one another, where there are different languages and different ethnicities and different faiths practiced, but for a lot of the refugee community there, they were enemies in their home countries. So you have Shia and Sunni Muslims, Kurdish and Arabic Muslims, um, you know, all of the, the conflicts that um, you imagine or that exist in the world, um, any kind of war is gonna produce refugees on both sides of that war. And there are many people living in Clarkson who are now living alongside um, their former enemy in their home country. And there's something really powerful about when you establish a culture of radical acceptance in that way. And um, you see the, the, that happening at the community, at the city scale in Clarkston. And so that was another kind of um, transformative power of, of being a source of refuge. And then obviously the American Refugee Resettlement Program is part of that too. Yeah, I mean, I had no idea about this town before watching this. Yeah. Um, and it just really kind of stood out to me like the perfect microcosm of what America is supposed to be about. Totally. You know, yeah. and it's all these different immigrants and people coming to this country to get united and to kind of come together and be like, look, we're different, but we're a community now. Mm -hmm. So we can find ways to get along. And I thought that was, that was a beautiful aspect. Um, in watching the film, you know, it is evident there's the old saying that hatred's taught. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, Chris was taught from his father hatred. Um, and then we later on see him sort of passing that down along to his children as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the same thing can be said about empathy, mm -hmm. right? And so talk a little bit about, like, Hival's uh, journey to educate and and to sort of like teach somebody like Chris about empathy mm -hmm. yeah so we um I love you bringing up empathy because you know as we were making this film one of our guiding lights that helped us make a lot of creative choices because we were making this when the refugee resettlement program was being obliterated in our country and there are a lot of versions of this film that we could have made. And as we were kind of whittling away at it, um, our kind of guiding light was we wanna bring something, we wanna create something that can rekindle our ability to empathize with each other because we felt like more and more we were dehumanizing people who were different than us, who voted differently than us, who you know, have a different faith in us, whatever that is. Um, and so we felt like we want to create something that rekindles our ability to empathize with, e with each other. Um, and also something that could, could bring us back together. And so the thing that I think is so powerful about Haval is that he didn't come in there with like, this is, this is why you're wrong. This is what you should think. This is what I think. He, he, he approached it relationally of like, if you know me, then maybe you wouldn't hate me and and also risk knowing this other guy and be confronted with um, Chris's, you know, hateful ideologies. And so I think there's something really powerful about just the vulnerability that Haval um, approached Chris with. And um, I think that's what kind of disarmed him, you know, and I think you see a lot of that, like, timid them getting to know each other in the texting scene. and. Part of the way, the reason that we chose to um, to shape that scene the way that we did, where we have their text exchange happening on top of the footage of them living their lives, is you're seeing these two people with wildly different lives, different jobs, different socioeconomic classes, different city and rural, and you're seeing them find common ground, you know, um, despite these differences. And we actually. Um, when they were getting to know each other it was through Facebook Messenger and so Chris gave us access to his Facebook account and we went in and filmed their um, actual initial text exchanges to know what were those initial conversations and so we shaped that scene and those actual texts from, um, from their actual text exchanges at the beginning. 
did those two ever quarrel? Or was there something in that? Because I felt like they were so um, civil with one another. And, yeah. and, you know, leading up to it, when I was watching this, I was expecting to see fireworks, expecting Chris to say something dumb and offensive or something yeah. like that. And, I mean, you touch a little bit on it in the, the car where they're kind of going back and forth about the gun oh, rights and stuff. <laughs> uh, but it didn't seem like... It didn't seem like Chris hated him, you know, the way yeah. that he was kind of making it seem like it just it, it, I didn't get the sense that these I mean, well, obviously not, but I didn't get the sense that Chris was going to be coming at him saying like, well, now, wait a minute, this and trying to, you know, spew his ideology onto him. Uh, so was that interesting? Was there something you guys left out there, like some fight that you guys thought, oh, maybe this isn't right. It's too political or something. Yeah. Um, a lot of it, you know, um, Haval, Haval talks a lot about how as a Muslim man in America, he doesn't have the luxury of coming across as being angry, which I totally get. And yeah. so I think he is both on camera and not on camera, a very self-controlled person emotionally, even if there, there are things that Chris said to him in front of him sometimes where I was like, I was just gonna go and you know I think it is not a privilege that he sees that he has of like mm -hmm. coming across as being angry and so I think that's a little bit um part of why their relationship um there were no no major fireworks they definitely have had um arguments and and disagreements especially around COVID and here we are have also a heart doctor and <laughs> he's right. like are we really gonna go down this right. road but that was obviously after we'd been filming um but they really there wasn't any kind of explosiveness that we've witnessed and I think a lot of that is um because of Haval feeling like he doesn't have that that luxury to be explosive um, and the patience that that guy, you know, has when yeah. that bus comes through. Yeah. I mean, it's so offensive. Yeah. So incredible. Like, you know, and he's trying to, like, pipe down the, the protesters. Yeah. You know, and it's like, wow. You know, like, he, he really does give off that natural leader kind yeah. of role. Yeah. Um, that is just, I respect greatly. Yeah. Um, that was a, a scarier day than it probably seemed like there just because you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if people were going to come out in support of Michael Williams. Mm -hmm. Literally nobody did, but mm -hmm. we didn't know that the yeah. day of. And, you know, so obviously we couldn't capture something that never happened, but right. it was a um, more scary and alarming day than it uh, seemed like. But it was amazing and so powerful. And none of us knew Haval was going to do what he did mm -hmm. where he, offered him baklava it was like <laughs> such a beautiful <laughs> and man he looked thing. so petty the the, yeah, the yeah. he looked so petty and weak in oh, that yeah. moment yeah uh you know like almost like here i am i'm doing this big grandstanding moment and he gets the, it's like the dog that catches the truck and doesn't know what to do with yeah, it totally. it was like he got there and maybe was expecting something and then he's greeted with kindness yeah. and compassion yeah. towards yeah. the people and he's sort of like uh uh you know like yeah. it, it was it was embarrassing to be yeah. honest with you yeah for um, sure and do you know who the whatever Haval asks him about the Kurdish people? Do you know the Kurds? He's like, no. <laughs> it's like, wow. What are you doing? <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Get back on the bus, man. I yeah. know. He at one point, I don't, I should know what happened with it, but um, Michael Williams was being investigated for campaign finance, of course, fraud or something. Yeah. So anyway, maybe he's in jail right now. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, one question I did want to ask you about because I was a little bit confused about the the timeline of it when you guys are at the with the KKK rally yeah and you have Chris there and he's you know with his child and everything and he seems to be very much a part of it but then there are other aspects of the film where he seems to be already removed from it when what's the timeline there when did that happen was that when you first met him or after so the first time we met Chris was the first time Haval met Chris um so it happened to be that the BBC did a um, documentary about the KKK in the US um, when Chris was in the Klan. Oh. And so we licensed that footage from them. So we, wow. I'm happy to tell you, we have never been to a KKK rally and I hope that's just the case. <laughs> um, wow. But 
I, you know, and we really went back and forth of like, should we include this footage, should we not? But we ultimately felt like, A, it shows just the, the horrors and the reality that we have active hate groups and the KKK is still around this day and age. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center actually has a hate map and they track active hate groups in the US and there are 800 right now active hate groups in the US, which is alarming. Um, and the KKK is one of them. Um, and we also felt like seeing Chris it wasn't just something that he was believing for himself, but seeing him indoctrinate his child felt important to show that that is um, where he was at to, to bring CJ into that, um, felt important to show that. And it really is, when I think about when we met CJ, he was really angry. He was an angry kid and I think that, um, you we could see him lighten up as Chris transformed and as Chris healed and so it was he was another thing that um it was kind of amazing to see him become a kid again as Chris was just overcoming his own hate and and racism but um but yeah we we have not been to KKK rallies good yeah good. wow that's interesting yeah. um I'm curious about and then I'm going to open this up to anybody who has any questions here. But, um, you know, how how exactly do we get a film like this in front of people like the old Chris, the people who really need to be watching it? Because, I yeah. mean, in, in some respects, and I'm going to just assume everybody here is not a racist, but, you know, uh, the the idea of like, you know, almost preaching to the choir kind of yeah. thing. Right. Where, you know, um, how do you get this? in front of is it having chris taking it to places you know like how do, how do you get this story in front of the people that should be watching it yeah for sure so we as we made this film we made we've been developing our impact and education campaign and our our kind of laser focused goal is to reach the melissas um knowing that they are the bridge and the connection between the chrises and um and possible healing and so um, Parents for Peace which is the organization you saw at the end of the film Chris now works full time with them and they are out there pulling people like Chris out of the KKK and they're also looking systemically at communities who are targeted by hate groups who are the communities who are more vulnerable to being groomed into hate groups and so um, the communities that they've identified are veterans um, active duty military first responders people with work-related trauma um the gaming community is a big place because it tends or it can be um, a more isolated community so the chat rooms and gaming communities and then um incarcerated men and women and so our impact and education campaign will be to reach those communities of you know the spouses of veterans the spouses of active duty military and so we'll take the film to those people to try to get it to the kind of Melissa's um, of the world. Good, good, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I found the the point of the, about the in the film about patriotism versus nationalism mm -hmm. to be probably the most important takeaway for me from the film. Um, you know, patriotism is that feeling of love, uh, you know, devotion, pride in in your country. Um, you know, whereas nationalism is more about that you believe your country is dominant, that, that you're the superpower, that you should be in control. And I'm curious if you would think, if, if you might agree that perhaps patriotism is sort of one of the keys to unlocking that which divides us, that, that you know, Chris, you know, is a patriot as well. And when he went to Clarkstown and he saw these people, he, I think he might have been able to connect that these people are now part of us and they love this country for the shelter it gave them and everything, the patriotism that, that Yuval has um, and, and the reverence in which he talks about America is something that can be a connection, you know, uh, yeah. across it. So I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the patriotism versus nationalism. And then uh, anybody who has any questions, please raise your hands after. Yeah. 
Um, Haval, or excuse me, Arno, he was so hard to cut down because he has just the most like mind-blowing and profound things to say. But I really love Arno's description. The difference between patriotism and nationalism is that nationalism requires a them. And I really like that because, you know, they can look the same on the outside, but you can love your country and also want your country to um, uh, be better, yeah. um, be something that it says that it could be. Um, but you don't need a them. You don't need, a, you know, um, yeah, an us versus them, I guess, to be a patriot, which I really liked that description of Arno, so. Very much so. Anybody with a question? Yeah? Yeah, um, how did you meet these men, or was Clarkson the starting point? What was the impetus for it? Yeah, so um, we started filming in Clarkson. Erin had been volunteering in Clarkson for about 10 years, and she felt like, to her credit, this was a community of people who, um, as refugees, they have been the survivors of extremism in their own country. They know firsthand the cost of when polarization goes unchecked and tribalism consumes a country and so she felt like this is a community whose voice needs to be heard in this moment in our country and it's also a community that just actively disproves white nationalism like come if you see this community white nationalism has no legs and so we had been filming there with Haval, Mama Mina and Mayor Ted who you saw just briefly in there um, for about six months when Haval called us and said, hey, I've, I've been introduced to this guy, Chris. We've been texting. I'm going to go meet him. He says, it's okay if you want to bring your cameras. Do you want to come? And we're like, yes, we do. And so for a long time, we were filming Chris and filming their growing relationship and really did not know how it fit together with the story about Clarkson that we thought we were you know, capturing and we thought that was the story. Um, and, it, and like I said earlier, it really was the title Refuge that really helped us kind of stitch together um, the two stories. But Chris was not part of it at the beginning. So it was a real shocker when a white supremacist, a white nationalist, <laughs> fell into our laps. <laughs> Any other questions? I wonder how they were measuring that or defining that. Like, if I'm curious, I want to look more into that. Like hate crime statistics. Another thing for Florida to hang their hat on. I, I suppose. know, right? <laughs> I'm from Alabama, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not any better. <laughs> you had a question back there? Uh, yes, I think. Um, I really love the film. Um, I thought it was nice at the ending how the one couple was getting married, the other couple was moving out. So that was amazing how that concluded. I, I did have a question for you about um, kind of how classism played in here. Mm -hmm. like, Approach, you know, as you referred to, to the common ground, you know, 
know, having their families and wives or wives to be and children, but how much of, I guess, him being impressed by him may have also contributed to um, the, their uh, progress together. Great question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I definitely think Haval's privilege is a huge part of um, the narrative that Chris had built up about Islam. Part of Haval's kind of, um, I don't know if sophisticated is the right word, but kind of wealthy status as a doctor. Um, I think that was an, a quickly disarming thing for Chris because it was one of the things that you see right off the bat um, that disproved the narrative that he had built around Islam. And um, I think it's, and I also, I really, really, it was amazing to see Haval's reaction to Chris too, to say, wow, yeah. like I get, I kind of get it, you know? He's like stuck in this rural town where the financial um, possibilities are fewer. He's struggling to just get food on his table you know, so the the kind of class difference between them was a huge um, part of a Haval's having empathy for Chris and um, and b I think um, Chris's perception of Haval and kind of feeling disarmed by Haval. I do think that was um, a big part of it for sure. And I think that you have a, a dynamic there where you know Chris. It's almost like he represents a bit of the white fragility of, of America where you have white Americans who believe that um, their dream, the American dream has been taken from them. Like, why don't I have that American dream? And then you see a refugee coming into America, making something of themselves. Mm -hmm. And they think, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, why are you getting those privileges that, that I'm not afforded, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so, yeah, I think that that, yeah, that was a, it's a good observation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions here? Yeah. I had, I mean, I thought it was very, very well done. Um, the, res the part that resonated the most with me was when he spoke about, about Americans and now he understands why there's so much hate. Mm -hmm. And I am Muslim. I grew up in California. My All my life experience was in multicultural cities. But I was still on the receiving end of a lot of it. But we never understood, like, where is this coming from? So this was very eye opening. Thank you. Yeah. It was eye-opening for me too. I mean, I I went into this with no no real understanding of extremism of any kind, um, and it really took like as we were filming and doing interviews with Chris and doing interviews with Arno, um, we were learning that along the way as well. Just the um, what's beneath hate, you know, and not in any kind of excusing way but if we don't understand what is mo what is compelling about extremist ideologies and Arno again really describes this really well that all versions of extremism are narratives of victimhood and you can switch around the us's and the thems but the narrative is the same we're being oppressed you are the oppressor we're the victims and again, it's just the us's and them's might be different if you're a white nationalist or a, a jihadist. But um, I think one of the things that was so powerful about getting to know Chris and getting to know Arno and seeing the work that they do for Parents for Peace is it does feel hopeful because when you understand how it works and the motivations that um, healing is possible for individuals and also um, preventing it is possible, you know, and the work that Parents for Peace is doing is 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 really really powerful. So I definitely encourage you, you know, follow along what they're doing um, and and support them if you can. So awesome. And what's next for you? What what do you guys have? What's what's the next project? Or is this just what you guys are focused on touring this around? And yeah, so I'm um, in development. Erin has a big kid job. She works at the Children's Hospital Hospital in Atlanta. Um, and I'm in development on a project that will follow several women who are pregnant and considering adoption for their unborn children. Um, I'm an adoptive mom, and I knew I wanted to have my next film touch on adoption in some way. And if you look into it for five minutes, you'll see there are stories out there about adoptees, and there are stories out there about adoptive parents, but the experience of 
being pregnant and considering that you might not be in a position to parent is totally unknown. We've kind of put our heads in the sand over what birth moms go through. And, um, you know, it's been interesting as an adoptive parent, when people ask us about our experience, the assumption I'm kind of cast as the hero and my daughter's birth moms are cast as, you know, at best kind of shameful or pitiable and at worst villainous. And, you know, it's, makes me wonder like why is that why am I perceived as being more worthy of my kids than they're the women who gave life to them and I think it's obviously a story that's like deeply personal to me and I think in a post-row America we need to understand what it is to be pregnant and consider you might not have the support or resources to raise your child and I think when we look at the experience, at that experience through the lens of adoption, I think it invites people to put their armor down and look systemically and ask why are women in the position to begin with where you might be pregnant and unable to parent. And I think we can look upstream, you know, is it I can't afford another child? Is it I didn't have access to affordable birth control? I don't have paid parental leave, whatever it is, I think when you look at that experience through the lens of adoption, um, we can start to ask some bigger questions and look systemically at it. So the project is called Love, comma, Your Birth Mom, Love Your Birth Mom, like a letter. So Beautiful. That's well, what's next. Hopefully <laughs> you'll be able to bring it here yeah. and we'll see you guys again and yeah. enjoy it. Everybody, let's give another round of applause. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, and the other